I want to talk about uh, a lot of the stuff on this disc, but first I wonder if you could tell us, Philippe, the, the story of how you got the idea to, to record the music of uh, Charlie Chaplin. Uh, sure. Um, about three years ago, I was working on uh, several concepts of CDs, CD concepts, rather. And, um, you know, I wanted to get away from the beaten path of doing same pieces over and over. I've uh, recorded a lot of uh, standard uh, major concertos repertoire, and I wanted to come up with something original. So uh, one of uh, my great passions and loves uh, when it comes to music is uh, exploring works of uh, film composers, as well as great classical composers that have written for film. So I started slowly putting together uh, one of those concepts. And while doing uh, some research on YouTube, I came across a song called Smile. Uh, that was, I believe, recorded by Gidon Kramer. And I heard that arrangement for violin and piano. And, and I thought to myself, well, that's a lovely song. I think it comes from a Hollywood film. I uh, wasn't sure which one, but uh, I did look at the credits and I noticed that Charlie Chaplin was credited as a composer. And I thought, well, surely that's a mistake. So I started uh, doing a little more research and I could not find any other composer next to Chaplin's name anywhere. So the light bulb did not go off at that point yet. <laughs> but uh, I thought to myself, that, well, that will be a great uh, song for my future album of film music. And uh, as you may know, YouTube has this uh, interesting function. When one song finishes, or when one video rather finishes, it throws you to the next one. And in my case, it threw me to the soundtrack of Limelight. And, and I heard this uh, film overture, which I thought... To myself, what a what a glorious music! What beautiful tunes! And once again, I looked at the credits and I see Charlie Chaplin, the composer. <laughs> That's when I think this may have been my aha moment when I thought, what else did he write? So I started uh, searching the web and uh, I came across an album of songs uh, published by Born, his publisher, and. Uh, that album had about 13 songs, and uh, I immediately noticed that uh, a lot of those songs had uh, beautiful melodies that would work great on violin. So this was really the beginning of the project. Uh, I uh, met with Martha and shared my idea of Chaplin with her. We both were very excited about this uh, discovery, and we started working uh, together on Smile and Eternally. Those were the, f the first two uh, tracks in collaboration with the New York arranger Charles Coleman. And then we picked maybe five or six other songs from that uh, published album that I mentioned. And so we had about seven songs at that point, and then adding three more from various sources and uh, creating a City Light suite, we had about 10. And those 10 arrangements only came to about 38 minutes of music, which was horrifying for us because <laughs> we were sure that we had at least two hours of music. Like well, Martha is laughing uh, here next to me because... Uh, we just remember that uh, glorious moment of realizing <laughs> that we have only such little time after so much work, almost two and a half years of work. So so then we added uh, three more, uh, and we asked another arranger, uh, Leon Gurevich, to help us uh, put together Fantasy from The Kid, which was a movie that I was familiar with and thought also it had glorious melodies. And that's a very long answer to your very short question. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. It covers a lot of bases. Yes. A mm -hmm. couple of things. Uh, um, in full disclosure, Charles Coleman is a good friend of mine. So we've actually oh, talked a, a little bit about, wonderful. about the album and his arrangements, which I think are just wonderful. There's a lot of um, – uh, there's a lot of humor as well as pathos in those arrangements uh, uh, as there are in the songs themselves. 
And uh, Charles told me, incidentally, that uh, he got to turn pages for a couple of weeks <laughs> he ago. Did. Right? And by the way, he yeah. was the best page turner of the entire tour. So, I, you know, he really was. He did a fabulous job. And that's a very important job. Yeah. He was our very overqualified page turner. He really turner. was. He was. It, it would be really embarrassing for him, I imagine, if he missed a page. <laughs> well, <laughs> one could argue that, you know, he was so swept away in the yeah. music. By he, his own by arrangements. By his own arrangements. I, I can see that totally with Charles. I can, I can see that happening. <laughs> um, now, I wonder if you could both talk a little bit. Philippe, you grew up in the in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. Uh, mm-hmm. Did you have any exposure to, to Charlie Chaplin and, and, you know, that sort of iconic tramp, you know, growing up? Was that a part of your experience at all? Yes. Um, luckily, luckily for me, uh, Chaplin was one of the Western uh, actors that was very popular in Soviet Union. Uh, partly because his movies were silent. So I think the Soviets felt that there was not going to be any poisonous uh, (laughs) message (laughs) conveyed through that. And second is, of course, you know, because, you know, I'm speculating Chaplin was banned out of United States, uh, I think, during the McCarthyist era on suspicions of his ties to Communist Party, which was not true. But uh, I think... uh, both of the factors uh, uh, allowed uh, Soviet TV to broadcast Chaplin's film. So I essentially grew up on many of the Chaplin's movies, of course, without paying attention what they are mm-hmm. or exactly what the story is. You know, we were just watching those images, frames, pictures, and it didn't mean much. But I do, I do remember dressing up as Charlie Chaplin for one of my kindergarten uh, events. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice. So but it's a very vague memory, honestly. Marta, you're from Chicago, right? I am. Yeah, so you have like you know the, the the American experience of Charlie Chaplin, which I don't think is too different from what Philippe is talking about. We have those kind of, you know, those distant memories of him as the tramp. And I do remember the big shoes. I remember, of course, not. The, I remember the baggy pants, the bowler hat. Of course, not realizing what it all at the time, what it all came from, where it all right. came from, you know, and that is really what has been so endearing about this entire project. You talked about the pathos in his songs. I mean, it was the pathos in his all his content of his movies. Everything was inspired by his past memories of hardship. Um, you know, even his his walk, that walk, that, you know, kind of back and forth walk was, you know, painful walking from you know the, the the homeless people in, in in South London, where their shoes didn't fit, they had to slice the sides open so their feet feet could fit in their their shoes. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what's been so endearing. It's this dichotomy between you know laughter and hardship, and his coping through hardship through laughter. Well, and that comes out in in the music. Obviously, one of the the wonderful things about this disc is yes, it has some of the those usual suspects uh, among Chaplin's work, but there's a wealth of music on here that I had never heard before and had no idea that that he was so prolific of a composer when it came to these kinds of melodies was that the same a similar experience for you as you you were discovering works of his absolutely just mind boggling uh how prolific he was uh as a composer and of course that prompted the question how did he do that uh you know being quite a busy man on the set, already uh, taking up roles of a producer, director, actor, uh, pretty much a one-man show, and Mm -hmm. adding uh, a composer to that already uh, challenging roster of jobs, uh, you know, would be uh, something essentially overwhelming for anybody to take on if you don't have training and if you don't understand how to write music. And he didn't write music. He was an uh, amateur composer. He was uh, amateur violinist, pianist, conductor, and later on arranger. It, it, and learning about his process of uh, putting music on page, that was, I think, also one of uh, great discoveries, which uh, came later in the process, you know, we we were essentially uh, learning on the job, you know, first, the attraction was the music, second was, 
how he composed it and who he was as a person and how he approached the world of music in general. And uh, he had a lot of great composers around him to help him, and he had a lot of great arrangers around him mm -hmm. to help him. And, you know, it was a team of people that was always working with him, and he was incredibly versatile in his knowledge of music, and he knew exactly what he wanted. So when he would show up on the set of a film, he would hum a melody to the composer or arranger, uh, and he would say that this is what I want for this particular uh, scene. And and he would hum the tune and he would sometimes say, here I'd like a little bit of Chopin, here I'd like a little bit of Debussy, and here please, you know, some Tchaikovsky. And you hear all the traces of that music in so many of mm -hmm. his films. Uh, you know, even in the modern times, he was going through a stage of really admiring the music of George Gershwin. And uh, there is a very famous uh, ship uh, sailing scene where uh, Rhapsody in Blue is quoted. No, not in its entirety, but you can clearly you uh, recognize one, one uh, the tune. Yeah, that, that one measure is <laughs> enough uh, as a quote. Uh, so, so you know, so, so that was a fascinating process, and and occasionally uh, he would look at an orchestral score that was given to him by a composer uh, or an arranger, and he would say, "Here are too many notes, and here are too little notes," and <laughs> and the arranger <laughs> would be quite perplexed in terms of what they should do. But right. but those were also very clear instructions that were coming from an incredible instinct that Chaplin had uh, as a person. And that instinct is what made him mm -hmm. different from everyone else that was working at the same time. Well, you, you mentioned little snippets of uh, classical composers found in modern times. And, and the title track, Smile, from modern times, uses uh, sort of a little riff from uh, Tosca, does it not? That da-da-da-da-da-da kind of thing? Well, this is the first time we hear this, so this is your discovery. <laughs> <laughs> I actually found it on Wikipedia, but oh. other than that, <laughs> okay, it's somebody else's discovery. But I hadn't noticed that before. It, it has that, that kind of, um, you know, that duet between Tosca and Cavaradossi. There's a familiarity, well, yeah. He, that, that was his influences were what, what was around him, you know, and... Yeah. Loved Verdi. Well, it was passionate music, and ev all of his music was, it was character-driven. It, it was a very important part of conveying his emotions of in his films. So anything moving, you know, any in any way, manner, shape, or form, I'm sure he would store in his mind just along his travels and just use in future future films. I, I, I want to give one last little uh, shout-out to Charles because I noticed that he folded a little of uh, La Vie en Rose into that yes. arrangement. That was that Charles' was, no, idea. That was Charles' idea. <laughs> that was <Yeah>. Charles' <laughs> idea. And then I remember... Uh, talking to him about it, and I said, well, I mean, is it, how, how is that going to fly? And he said, well, it's going to fly very well because it's from the same period, and it's a little mm -hmm. bit of an homage. Mm -hmm. And and he said, Chaplin would really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And and I said, you know what? I agree. Let's keep it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, there's just a wealth of discoveries to be found on this. Uh, wonderful mm -hmm. arrangements. A and you also have uh, Joshua Bell on this recording, right? Oh, yes. My dear colleague and friend, Joshua Bell, uh, with whom I collaborated uh, multiple times, and this is our first uh, recording together. I just thought that he was an ideal person to join uh, this project. Uh, when the project was picked up by uh, Warner Classics, uh, they actually asked me if there was uh, a guest artist that I would consider bringing on board. And Josh's name uh, came immediately, and I suggested uh, him and uh, spoke with Josh, and he uh, found the project absolutely fascinating, I must say. And, and of course, it was right up his uh, alley, you know, him... Uh, also doing many, many song arrangements in the last uh, decade and doing it creatively, uh, virtuosically. And uh, he just added really a lot to being part of Smile and Mandolin uh, Serenade with uh, also having great ideas, mm -hmm. with uh, wonderful suggestions, and it was just wonderful to work with. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way that you imitate the mandolin in that mm -hmm. particular. <laughs> that was your idea. That was Philip's this, idea. <laughs> this was my idea because I, 
wanted to come up with some solution that we don't have to actually bring mandolin player. <laughs> ah, yeah, and, that's good. And yeah, it was it was quite challenging, but I think the effect really mm-hmm. uh, worked with uh, mixing uh, the effect with actually playing pizzicato on violin with uh, a tremolo in the bow. So that's um, that's an effect that you hear throughout mandolin serenade. That's great. Well, violinist Philip Quint and pianist Marta Aznavourian, the album is called Chaplin's Smile from uh, Warner Classics. Thanks so much for joining us and talking about it and sharing the music here on FM 91. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Brad. Uh, 